Uber is the most ethically challenged company in, in Silicon Valley. The story of Uber begins on a winter's night in Paris in 2008. Two friends, Travis and Garrett, stood waiting for a taxi, which was late. They were cold, frustrated, and wondering if their cab was ever going to show up at all. But, as with any good entrepreneurs, every problem is a potential opportunity. That night in Paris planted a seed in their minds that would lead to a billion dollar empire. But this is not your typical business story. The story of Uber is littered with scandals and controversy at every single turn. Because whilst the idea for Uber was in many ways revolutionary, it was also illegal. Travis Kalanick faced relentless bullying when he was young and often threw himself into his work as an escape. As a teenager, he sold kitchen knives in his local neighborhood, cold calling door to door and honing his natural sales skills, a talent that would later prove invaluable in helping him pitch investors for money. But before starting Uber, Travis had dropped out of college to work on another entrepreneurial venture called Scour, a peer-to-peer -peer search engine for files that was a little like Napster. And just like Napster, it would get sued into oblivion. Scour got sued for $250 billion because of copyright infringements, meaning the company had to declare bankruptcy. Travis was bitter about this and went on to start what he calls a revenge business. The name of the company is called Red Swoosh. The idea was the same peer-to-peer -peer technology, but I take those 33 litigants that sued me and turn them into customers. So now those dudes who sued me are now paying me. Travis would eventually sell this business for millions of dollars, giving him the money needed to start an even bigger project, Uber. Travis and his friend Garrett had become increasingly frustrated with taxi companies and figured there had to be a better alternative. But it was actually during a James Bond movie that the idea for Uber came to them. In one scene, Bond tracked a car across a map using his phone. And this would form the basis of their new app, which was originally called Uber Cab and launched publicly in 2010 in San Francisco. Uber Cab aimed to solve the problems of a traditional taxi experience. Firstly, you could order an Uber with the touch of a button on your phone rather than calling someone. Secondly, you could watch the car's journey across the map so you knew it was on its way and how long it would take. Thirdly, Uber had luxury black cars with leather interiors which would show up spotless, complete with chilled bottles of water in the back. And finally, the payment would be seamless. The ride would be automatically charged to your card so you didn't have to mess about with change or a tip. In other words, it was originally a luxury black cab and limousine service to give you a small taste of the James Bond experience. And thus, getting an Uber quickly became a status symbol in the wealthy San Francisco area. It was a great start for the company, at least for the first few months. Then, on October 20th, the transportation agency showed up at Uber's offices and informed them that what they were doing was against the law. Now, at this point, all of Uber's drivers were licensed professional drivers registered with local transportation offices. So Uber felt this was incredibly harsh. But apparently, there were strict rules about running a taxi business, and Uber was breaking them. One element of this was that Uber didn't actually own the cars themselves. They were getting professional drivers to use their own cars, which saved Uber huge amounts of money, but created some legal issues. The local authorities told them for every day Uber Cab was in operation, the company faced fines of up to $5,000 per trip. Not just that, but they said the Uber team could face up to 90 days in jail for each day that the company remained operational. The small Uber team was both devastated and terrified. Most of them were in their 20s, some had just come straight from college, and now they were being threatened with fines and potential jail time. One of them nervously asked, what do we do? But one man wasn't worried. Travis Kalanick, Uber co-founder and CEO, told the office confidently, we do nothing, we ignore it. He went on to say that they'd simply drop the cab part of their name and just be known as Uber. He announced, we're not a taxi company, we're a technology company, so these rules and regulations don't apply. Travis would frequently come up with creative definitions like this that would save the company billions of dollars, but create a lot of controversy. For example, he also said that drivers of Uber weren't employees, they were partners, thus meaning Uber didn't have to give them employment rights or benefits. 
Of course, Travis knew the authorities were unlikely to see his way of thinking on these issues. So, he prepared for war. Travis knew that if he could get enough people using the Uber app, they'd see it was a better way to travel. And at that point, the authorities wouldn't be able to shut them down without facing huge public backlash. But they had to move quickly. So, Uber struck a deal with AT&T to buy thousands of iPhones in bulk at a discounted price. They would then hand these out to drivers pre-programmed to run Uber's software. They also offered them cash bonuses for completing a certain number of trips per week. This immediately brought lots of new drivers onto their network very quickly. Then, to get riders, Uber offered to give away the first trip completely free. After all, who wouldn't want a free taxi ride? Uber would then give the second and third trip away at a discounted price to encourage them to use the service again, believing that if someone had tried it a few times, they'd see the value and be willing to pay full price in future. This strategy was incredibly expensive, since the company lost money on every ride. But it paid off. Because soon many people started exclusively using Uber instead of normal taxis. And then Uber began expanding into other cities by replicating this same strategy, offering generous promotions up front along with referral bonuses, so the app became popular very quickly, meaning that by the time the city's authorities started questioning what Uber was doing and whether it was even allowed, they already had a loyal, active user base. Then, whenever local authorities threatened them, Uber would send out alerts to users on the app with a button to easily sign a petition supporting Uber, or even a button to email their local representatives to express their support for Uber, using a pre-filled email template. Whenever Uber sent out these alerts via their app, local councils and regulators would soon find their inboxes flooded with people saying they support Uber and don't want it to be shut down. Uber would also organize protests outside City Hall and ask users of the app to come and make their voices heard. Although in one particular protest in New York, not many Uber users showed up to support them. So Uber just told all their employees from one of their offices to go and protest instead. The local authorities didn't realize that most of the support was coming from paid Uber employees. But in Travis's view, Uber wasn't doing anything wrong. He said, there's been so much corruption and cronyism within the taxi industry where corrupt taxi cartels pay corrupt politicians to protect them. So if you ask for permission up front, you'll never get it. He believed Uber was better for both riders and drivers, but that there was no way they could win by playing by the rules. So he completely ignored them. However, in 2012, the battle between Uber and regulators became much more fierce, when Uber launched a new service called UberX, which allowed almost anyone to be a driver for the company, which opened up all kinds of new legal issues. And by this point, city officials had already realized that Uber wasn't very cooperative, so they instead threatened drivers, and essentially said, if we catch anyone driving for Uber, we'll fine you, clamp your cars, and tow them away. The idea was to scare people to stop them from using the app so that Uber would never gain any momentum. But Travis and Uber were already several moves ahead. Firstly, they regularly sent out notices on the app saying that any fines or fees incurred whilst driving for Uber would be fully reimbursed. Travis viewed these as just another business expense. But the real genius was that Uber developed a secret system so that local cities wouldn't catch them. And it was called Grayball. Travis knew the authorities would download the Uber app themselves so they could track the cars within the app. However, Uber developed a software to detect when police, regulators, or local council members tried to join the app. And then they would grayball them, which is effectively like shadow banning. If you get grayballed, you can still open the app, but it looks like there are no cars driving on the map. And if you try to order a ride, it just tells you there's no drivers nearby. Whereas if you viewed Uber with a normal non grabled account, you'd see that really there were loads of nearby drivers. Now, how did Uber know who to grayball? Well, firstly, they use location data. And if you downloaded or used Uber from certain areas like a police station or government offices, you'd get flagged. 
Uber could then check the personal data of that account, including things like their credit card information, and cross-reference that with social media to check if it was a real user trying to use the app, or if it was someone associated with a government agency or law enforcement, or anyone who might be trying to shut Uber down. The Grable software also detected suspicious activity, like someone opening and closing the app lots of times without ordering a ride. Uber even recruited ex-CIA, NSA, and FBI employees to help them improve the Grable software, as well as to spy on local government officials and track where they went. Essentially, Uber built their own corporate espionage team. And it worked. There are countless stories of authorities ordering an Uber, hoping to catch the Uber driver in the act and find them for breaking the rules. But instead, suddenly their order would get cancelled, as supposedly there were no Uber drivers using the app. The authorities just thought that people were following their warnings and not driving for Uber, when in reality, they were seeing a fake map with all the cars hidden, because they'd been greyballed. So they had no chance of catching Uber or its drivers. Of course, Uber kept this operation highly secret. In fact, it wasn't until 2017 when an investigation discovered that Uber had been invading local authorities for years by using these systems digital equivalent of that sort of greed is good mentality, the Gordon Gecko kind of mentality, which is we, we will do this, we can do this, and no one's going to stop us. Uber also spent vast sums of money on lobbying governments to legalize their service. So by the time that Uber's secret Grable operation was discovered and people realized the deceptive practices they'd been using, Uber were already up and running legally in most major cities and was too popular to shut down, just like Travis had planned all along. Once Uber had support and leverage in a city, it's reported that they treated negotiations with local authorities like hostage situations. Basically, once Uber knew they had the power and the public support, they used that to get legislation changed to accommodate their business model, such as changing the laws about contract workers so that Uber didn't have to give drivers full employment benefits. Of course, Uber's battles would never really stop. Even to this day, just look at Uber in the news right now and you'll see people protesting Uber and some cities banning it altogether. But in those early years, Uber devised a systematic playbook for evading the rules and outwitting the local authorities. And that's what allowed them to expand so rapidly. The only problem was that an even bigger battle was just beginning. Travis got a call one morning from a friend of his, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg. Mark told him that all his employees at Facebook were going crazy over a new app called Lyft. Now, it's actually still debated to this day whether Lyft copied Uber or Uber copied Lyft. Because even though Uber started first, remember when they first began, they were a luxury black cab service. It wasn't until 2012, the year Lyft launched, when Uber became a more affordable service that let anyone drive for them. Suddenly, these two ride-sharing apps offering the same service were going head to head. And most people who know Travis well have commented one thing. In any form of competition, he seeks nothing less than utter domination. Travis believed there could only be one winner, and he would stop at nothing to make sure he was on the winning side. So he wasn't afraid to play dirty. For example, one of Lyft's most effective marketing techniques was to hold driver events, small parties with food and games to try and get local communities interested in driving for Lyft. But Uber would frequently crash these parties and hand out promotion codes where drivers could get free money if they joined Uber instead of Lyft. They basically hijacked the parties Lyft was paying for and recruited people to join Uber instead. Another promotion technique Lyft used was giving out giant pink mustaches that drivers could put on the front of their cars, a fun and simple gesture designed to make Lyft more recognizable. In response, Uber put up billboards everywhere Lyft was operating, urging people to shave the stash and come use Uber instead. Uber also created a vast amount of fake accounts on Lyft so they could track the locations of Lyft drivers and feed all of this data into another secret software they created called Hell. The reason for the name is because Uber also had a system called Heaven, which was a god view map of all Uber drivers active on their system. But Hell was the opposite, a god view map of Lyft drivers. The reason for this was that then Uber could figure out which drivers were using both Uber and Lyft. Uber would then offer those drivers extra rides and cash bonuses, so they always took jobs with Uber instead of Lyft. 
The goal was to get these drivers to stop using Lyft completely because Uber seemingly paid them more money when really Uber were deliberately paying them higher than their other drivers to lure them away from a competitor. Once they stopped using Lyft, the bonuses would end. And Uber didn't stop there. For any drivers who were exclusively using Lyft and not Uber, they would order a ride on the Lyft app from a location near that particular driver. And when the driver showed up, an Uber employee would try and recruit them to join Uber instead. It's even reported that sometimes Uber employees would use burner phones and order lots of Lyft rides all at once and then cancel the rides at the last second. In later years, when the public found out how Uber had been sabotaging Lyft and stealing their drivers, they faced a lot of backlash. But Travis and Uber didn't think they'd done anything wrong. They believed business was a competition and you had to do whatever it takes to win. Not just that, but it seemed Travis enjoyed the fight. He would even troll Lyft's founder on Twitter. However, perhaps one of the biggest reasons Uber did so well compared to Lyft was that Travis would find out whenever Lyft had investor meetings to raise money. And then he would immediately call those investors straight afterwards to tell them that Uber would be raising money very soon as well. Investors knew Uber was the bigger company, and since they couldn't invest in two rivals, investors often backed out of any deals with Lyft to invest in Uber instead. It also helped that Travis was a natural showman. He had a real talent for dazzling investors and getting them hyped about how huge Uber was going to be. He'd tell them that one day, Uber wouldn't just transport people, but transport every good you can think of and deliver anything to anywhere, and thus could be a serious rival to Amazon. He'd get investors excited about his vision, but then, after the meeting, he wouldn't reply to them for a little while to make it seem like he didn't really need the money, which just made the investors even more eager to invest. It wasn't long before Uber was getting some huge investments from venture capital funds, including a staggering $258 million from Google Ventures. And of course, more investors meant Uber had more money to spend on expansion and marketing, so they were always going to have an advantage over competitors by having a bigger budget. Here's just a few examples of some of the publicity stunts Uber pulled to get more attention. Look, Valentine's Day, we distributed tens of thousands of roses to thousands of drivers. Every girl who got in a car after 4 p.m. was handed a rose by the driver. In President's Day um, in D.C., we uh, did what we call an Ubercade, okay? Escalade, town car, Escalade, American flags all the way down. One out of every 20 people that push the button, an Ubercade rolls up. But hold up, hit the brakes. Whilst Uber's publicity stunts might seem like all fun and games, let's be clear, the story of Uber has a much darker side. So far, we've seen Uber be unethical in their efforts to beat Lyft, and we've seen Uber break the law to outwit local authorities. But believe me, things are about to get even more controversial. Before we get to the next chapter, I want to tell you about today's video partner, Firstbase, an all-in-one incorporation platform that's helping founders easily launch a US-based business from anywhere in the world. As an entrepreneur, you want to be focusing on running the business, not dealing with complex paperwork. But with Firstbase, they'll take care of all of that for you. They'll help you incorporate your company, get a tax ID, open a business bank account, and get free tax and legal advice. You'll even get access to $150,000 worth of free credits and discounts on major software and services your business Business will likely need. So if you want to turn your idea into a real business, Firstbase makes it fast and simple. Just visit the link below and use the code MAGNATES10 to get 10% off. The rise of Uber left Doug Shifter financially ruined. He wrote on Facebook, when the taxi industry started, I averaged 40 to 50 hours a week but I cannot survive any longer working 120 hours. I am not a slave and I refuse to be one. Shortly afterwards, Doug drove to City Hall, put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. Doug is certainly not the only driver who has taken their own life and cited Uber as the reason. In India, one driver who couldn't make his car loan payments on time committed suicide, which led to an angry mob of drivers showing up at Uber's offices, carrying his dead body, shouting that if Uber's wages weren't so low, that driver would still be alive today. Now, Travis's view on Uber was simple. We're making drivers' lives a hell of a lot better. They're making a lot more money. They're making ends meet. They're living their American dream, and Uber's helping them do that. Riders are getting around town much more efficiently. I'm not sure who hurts from this, 
And as some people would agree with Travis, the Uber was simply a more innovative and efficient system that gives drivers a way to earn extra money and passengers cheaper and easier rides. Win-win, right? Well, not necessarily. Many others have pointed out that whilst drivers may earn more at first glance, that money is then eaten up by fuel, taxes, and car maintenance, often leaving them with less than minimum wage. Plus, Uber drivers don't have secure employment or many of the benefits they would normally get with a taxi company. Not to mention the fact that letting almost anyone be a driver opens up all kinds of safety risks to the public. Needless to say, neither taxi drivers nor taxi operators were going to let Uber win without a fight. Literally. Countless anti-Uber movements have been staged by taxi operators and drivers, such as causing a gridlock on the road in protest of Uber. It's also reported that in some countries, there are taxi cartels, which had ties to organized crime, who would assault Uber drivers, steal their cars, or even light them on fire. In some places, such as Mexico, there are reports of Uber drivers literally being killed, with many people suspecting local taxi operators. This was an all-out war between Uber and traditional transportation. The truth is, everyone has their own opinion on whether Uber are the good guys or the bad guys in this story. But what's undeniable is that wherever Uber went, they were constantly surrounded by controversy. In 2014, a 26-year-old ordered an Uber to take her home after a late night at the office. It was a long trip and she dozed off in the back of the car. When her driver noticed, he changed route and switched off his phone, making him untraceable to Uber and the police. He found a secluded area to park and climbed into the back of the car and raped her. He then threatened to kill her if she told the police. As he drove off, she managed to snap a photo of his number plate, and thankfully, the police were able to catch him. But the story went viral, and many people blamed Uber's lack security. This simply reinforced beliefs that Uber wasn't safe. Some countries even temporarily banned ride-hailing services like Uber completely. Now, of course, given the huge number of rides taken with Uber, incidents like this always seem like a possibility. And of course, traditional taxi companies have had horror stories like this too. But many people felt Uber had lowered the bar so much to become a driver, which had added a higher risk. And despite many more horrific incidents like this over the years, Uber refused to raise the entry requirements to become a driver. There are even reports that at Uber HQ, whenever a sexual assault victim decided not to pursue litigation or police evidence wasn't conclusive enough, the Uber team would cheer. It also emerged that credit card thieves have been using Uber for both drug trafficking and sex trafficking. And because of all the free cash bonuses Uber gave away to new drivers, Uber had been inadvertently funding all kinds of criminal activity. Now, I would argue that when Uber first began, public sentiment towards the company was very positive. Uber was cheaper, innovative, and it was the underdog going against traditional transportation. But as the years went by, public sentiment began to shift. News articles broke about how Uber had used Grable to deceive cities and how they'd used black hat tactics to try and crush Lyft and other competitors. And the bad press just kept coming. For example, it was found that in Indonesia, Uber had been bribing police officers and they'd then been forging receipts for those illegal bribes so they could count them as business expenses. Uber also faced serious data and privacy issues. At one point, Travis changed Uber's settings so the app could track people even after they'd ended their ride because he wanted to see where people went after being dropped off by their Uber. It's also reported Uber looked at the data of individual users, such as celebrities, to see where they were traveling and when. In later years, Uber paid hackers $100,000 to cover up a massive data breach that exposed the personal data of 57 million Uber customers. Uber would also have to pay $28.5 million to settle a lawsuit because Uber had falsely advertised that it had industry-leading background checks, which it evidently didn't. But one of the biggest PR disasters of all for Uber came in 2017, when taxi drivers were striking to protest Trump's ban on Muslim countries. Uber ignored the strike, which meant they rendered the strike ineffective and they profited from the fact that taxi drivers weren't driving. Many people were outraged and Delete Uber began trending on Twitter. Over half a million people deleted their accounts and likely many more millions deleted the app from their phone. Lyft, who had almost been crushed by Uber, suddenly had a resurgence as people switched to using them instead. This incident, combined with everything else, 
meant Uber's public reputation was reaching a new all-time low. Uber had still been growing and expanding, but public sentiment towards them had been worsening day by day. And I'd love to tell you that this is the part of the story where Uber turn it all around, where they win back public trust and solve all their issues. But I can't tell you that, because things are about to get even worse. Travis was desperate for Uber to become popular in China, since it's a market of nearly one and a half billion people. But very few international tech companies do well in China. So Travis invested billions of dollars into giving away free rides and bonuses to drivers, just like Uber had done when it started out in other cities. However, in China, this didn't go quite so well. Scammers in China started purchasing caseloads of cheap smartphones and set half of them up with driver accounts and half of them up with passenger accounts. A scammer would then request rides from one of their passenger phones and use one of their driver phones to accept it. They'd then drive around the streets with dozens of phones spread across the seats. Now remember, the rides were all free for the passenger phones because of Uber's promo codes. And the driver phones still kept the money for the ride too. Plus, the driver accounts got extra bonus money that Uber was offering to new drivers. In other words, the scammers were getting paid twice for every fraudulent trip they did. And after riding around for hours and racking up a huge fare, the driver would simply cash out the money, completely reset the phones, and repeat the process again with brand new Uber accounts. So basically, scammers were making loads of money by exploiting Uber's promo codes, and Uber was losing millions and millions of dollars on fake trips. The thing is, because of an Apple privacy update, Uber were not allowed to track IMEI numbers, which is the unique number associated to every smartphone. Therefore, they couldn't tell when fraudsters were just wiping their iPhone and making a brand new Uber account to claim the free bonus payments over and over again. And yet, despite all of the money Uber was losing to scammers, Travis refused to cancel the promotions because he knew Uber wouldn't succeed in China if they didn't offer riders and drivers free money for initially joining. So instead, Uber found a way to bypass Apple's rules. They inserted some hidden code into their app to track the data they needed, which would help them stop scammers making multiple new accounts from the same device. But doing this completely broke Apple's terms of service. Uber disguised the code so the App Store moderators wouldn't notice. But Apple did eventually find out, and they were furious. They threatened to ban Uber from the App Store completely. In many ways, this example epitomizes Uber, because on one hand, they felt they were simply doing what was necessary to beat corruption and save their company. But on the other hand, it's yet another case of Uber completely disregarding the rules and just doing whatever they wanted. But even without all the scammers trying to rip Uber off, things were hard enough for Uber in China as it was, because there was a rival app that offered the same service called Didi. And because they were a Chinese company, the Chinese government heavily favored them. Didi would also pay local taxi operators to protest Uber and send fake texts to Uber drivers telling them Uber had closed down and that they could come work for them instead. Didi also told some employees to go undercover and apply for a job at Uber. Then if they got hired, they acted as moles, collecting private internal information about Uber and its plans and strategies. When Uber had begun in the US, it was them who were the ones using such shady practices. But in China, the tables had turned. Eventually, after billions of dollars of losses and fraud, Uber made a deal with Didi, where Uber would stop operating in China, but get a 17.7% equity stake in their business. Uber's investors were actually very happy about this, but Travis was frustrated he hadn't won the battle. He'd wanted to be the first Silicon Valley entrepreneur to truly crack China, and he didn't like the idea of compromising instead of winning, even if it did make financial sense. The whole experience with China had really just made Travis even more cynical and truly believing the entire world was against him and Uber. And in a way, he was right. Even Uber's own drivers had started to turn on them. And Travis ended up getting into an argument with an Uber driver that got recorded on the car's dash cam and went viral. What am you I did the whole business. What? what? You dropped the prices on, on black. Yes, you did. Bull did with $20. Bull we started with $20. You know what? How much is the mile now? $275? You know what? What? Some people don't like to take responsibility for I their own. They blame everything but in why their you life on the email for town card. Good luck. 
In the middle of all of this controversy, Uber's other co-founder, Garrett, who had taken a much less active role in the business, publicly confirmed Uber's plans to get involved with self-driving cars. Is this something that you think is going to play a big role in Uber's future? I mean, I think it's pretty much inevitable. I mean, it, it is going to happen. Of course, self-driving cars would eliminate the need for drivers. And so many Uber drivers saw this as yet more proof Uber didn't care about them at all. However, from Uber's point of view, they felt they had to start working on self-driving cars because otherwise another company like Google could come out with a ride-sharing app of their own that uses self-driving cars that could put Uber out of business. So Uber actually started poaching some of Google's self-driving engineers so they could work on this technology for Uber. Unfortunately, this actually led to yet another lawsuit for Uber because Google claimed that Uber had tried to steal trade secrets from them about their self-driving vehicles. However, the real irony to all of this was that whilst Uber was busy fighting attacks on all fronts, regulators, competitors, public backlash, driver backlash, China, Google, lawsuits, and more, Uber's biggest threat of all wasn't any of these things. Uber's biggest threat of all was itself. Work was everything to Travis. All he thought about was building a great company. He often wouldn't wash his clothes, see his friends. He'd be working all hours of the day on growing Uber. And he expected the same of his employees. In his view, being at Uber wasn't a job, it was a mission. Employees often kept working even after they went home. This reports that some staff were seeing therapists to deal with the burnout and intensity of the job. Although, ironically, many of them missed their appointments due to being too busy at work. But there were several reasons Uber employees gave so much to the job. One of them was that Travis always positioned Uber as us versus them. Travis loved the book, The Art of War, and he created a siege mentality within the company, that it was Uber against the world, that they were constantly in an existential fight. But it wasn't just that. Travis is also a showman and a very charismatic leader. So when he told you that you are part of this important, world-changing mission, you believed him. And he believed it himself. They all felt that the 12-hour workdays would be worth it in the end. They'd be part of history and eventually get a big payout. Employees at Uber also loved that Travis trusted them with a lot of power to make big decisions without needing approval. Travis basically wanted an army of young and hungry entrepreneurs, and he would assign each of them to a different city and tell them to go and make Uber a success there, using whatever tactics or budget they deemed necessary. This is how Uber was able to act so fast. It wasn't structured like a normal big bureaucratic organization. Travis had all these small teams, each focused on conquering individual cities. This worked incredibly well sometimes, but it also meant that teams at Uber weren't just fighting competitors, they were fighting against each other internally, and occasionally even backstabbing each other, since they were acting as individual teams rather than one united company. Now, I realize so far I've used a lot of war and battle language when talking about Uber, but that's because that's how Travis saw it himself. Business was war. and. Whilst this attitude was responsible for a lot of Uber's growth, it was also the reason for a lot of Uber's controversies and the competitive dog-eat-dog -dog alpha culture they ended up creating. However, Uber also embodied the mantra, work hard, play hard. It was an Uber tradition to throw a huge party for hitting targets. And Travis would fly employees all around the world for various celebrations. One particularly infamous Uber party was their X to the X event, hosted in Las Vegas, which cost the company around $25 million. Each employee was given a prepaid credit card filled with money to spend, and Travis even got Beyonce to perform at the event. Yeah quite a contrast to your traditional work party. In fact, Travis announced Beyonce and her husband Jay-Z were now investors in Uber. Although, technically, Travis had simply given them stock for attending the event. But still, for Uber's young workforce, it was surreal to be partying with global celebrities. Unfortunately, the exciting culture of Uber also had a much darker side. And there was one incident in particular which really set in motion Travis's ultimate downfall. But before we get to that, it's important to acknowledge that in the early days of Uber, saying you worked there was something to brag about. It was only as the years went by and public sentiment towards the company changed that the opinions of their own employees started to change as well. Some employees quit completely, saddened by what the company had become and all the controversy and scandals that surrounded it. And one of Uber's biggest scandals that caused a lot of that 
was when a past employee called Susan Fowler accused the company of systematic sexual misconduct. Susan said that her boss had sexually harassed her, but that HR had dismissed the allegations because it was his first offense and he was a valuable part of the team. However, it was later revealed that this was not the first accusation of sexual harassment against this employee, and Uber had frequently ignored the claims against him. When this information became public, other Uber employees started speaking up about the misogyny, harassment, and abuse they'd faced from senior employees at Uber. The floodgates were open, and all the details of Uber's misconduct and toxic culture became very public. To Travis's credit, he acted quickly and ordered an independent investigation into the company's culture. When they finished, they compiled a report with their findings. It contained hundreds of allegations of physical violence, sexual assault, and many other accusations made by current and former Uber employees. It was far worse than Travis could have imagined. Just reading the report was sickening. Uber's culture had become toxic, and until now, a lot of it had been swept under the carpet. Once again, Travis sprung into action, and Uber held a company-wide meeting where all of the Uber board were on stage to discuss how they could improve Uber's culture. It was notable that at the time, there was only one woman on the board, Ariana Huffington. She spoke on stage to the Uber employees, reassuring them that she'd be focusing on addressing the issues of sexism within Uber's culture. She also pointed out that now that there was one woman on the board, it would likely mean there would soon be a second female board member as well. However, at that very moment, one of the male board members interrupted her and said, Actually, what it shows is it's much likely to be more talking. The room fell silent. In the middle of a company-wide presentation that was meant to show everyone that Uber was addressing its issues with sexism, one of the male board members had just made a sexist joke about women talking too much. Seriously, that was real leaked audio you just heard. Unsurprisingly, this story made yet more controversial headlines for Uber, and to many people, it proved that Uber's culture problems started at the very top of the company. It also didn't help that in a GQ profile, Travis had previously told a reporter that he called Uber Booba, because attracting women was so much easier now that he was the CEO of a big company. Uber had also had to apologize a few years before that for running a promotion in France that advertised free rides from incredibly hot chicks. It genuinely seemed that Uber was simply bouncing from one controversy to another, and each incident just chipped away at Uber's reputation a little further. Travis was already a tense person, but the pressure and stress of everything going on left him feeling suffocated. At one point, it's reported that Travis collapsed on all fours and broke down, muttering, I'm terrible. And in the middle of all of this chaos surrounding Uber, the lawsuits, the sexism, the negative media attention, everything, Travis then got a call that his parents had been involved in a freak boating accident, which had hospitalized his father and killed his mother. Shortly after this, in June 2017, Travis announced he was taking a leave of absence from Uber to work on himself and he vowed that when he returned, he would be a better leader and a better person. But little did Travis know, he would never be coming back. Breaking news, Uber CEO Travis Kalanick resigning overnight amid recent scandals. Kalanick is out entirely, at least as CEO of Uber, reportedly under pressure from some of the startup's largest shareholders. Within a month of Travis taking his leave of absence to work on himself, he resigned as Uber CEO. However, this was not by choice. The Uber board and investors had forced him out as they blamed him for many of Uber's controversies. In fact, one of Uber's early investors, Benchmark Capital, sued Travis over fraud allegations. A VC firm suing one of its own CEOs was a big deal, and it just shows how far they were willing to go to get rid of Travis. Travis understandably felt betrayed and hurt especially when it was leaked that he'd been forced to resign instead of it being by choice. And Travis was right to feel hurt, because whilst he's undeniably a polarizing character, let's be very clear, 
it's quite likely Uber would never have become the giant company it is today if it weren't for Travis. Travis had studied Jeff Bezos and the way he ran Amazon, especially his focus on reinvesting profits in pursuit of continual growth and expansion. And that was partially why Uber grew so rapidly. Travis also admired the way Bezos pushed Amazon into new markets, and Travis had tried to do the same with Uber. This led to some failures like Uber Rush, but also some huge successes like Uber Eats food delivery. And Travis still had plenty more ideas on how to expand Uber further into other new and exciting markets. But he'd never get to do that. Instead, Travis had been kicked out of his own company. It had been a wild journey, starting from that night in Paris with his friend Garrett, to building a billion dollar company that's completed over 20 billion trips worldwide. But finally, for Travis Kalanick, this was the end of the ride. Since the departure of Travis, Uber has been much steadier. The new CEO has been focused on repairing the relationship with drivers and improving brand perceptions with customers. Sure, there's still been a few controversies, like an Uber self-driving car killing a pedestrian, and protests against Uber from its own drivers and taxi companies would never really stop. However, compared to when Travis was in charge, Uber mostly stayed out of the headlines, which investors were very relieved by. So when Uber had its IPO, which is the sale of its shares to the public, investors believed the demand would be booming now that Uber was in safer hands. However, on the first day of Uber's shares trading on the stock market, Uber's dollar value decreased more than any other IPO on Wall Street since 1975. In other words, the public were not that sold on Uber. Now, you may be wondering if the reason for that is because Uber's reputation is still tainted from all their various scandals. But actually, the reason might simply be that Uber is still losing money every year. Sure, it's very common in the first few years of a business to prioritize growth over profit, just like Amazon did so successfully. But Uber is now over a decade old, and yet they lost $8.51 billion in 2019 and $6.77 billion in 2020. Just to be clear, if you started a business today and made a sale of $1 and did nothing else all year, you could legitimately claim to be more profitable than Uber by a huge margin. Of course, I'm being facetious here. Uber will argue they are simply still in the growth and expansion phase, and profits will come later down the road. But clearly investors aren't quite as confident. Sure, without Travis as CEO, Uber looks steadier and a more mature company. But at what cost? Without Travis's relentless drive for rapid expansion, his constant hunger for innovation, and his merciless desire to win at all costs, is Uber going to stagnate? Are they still going to take on the world in the same way they had with Travis? An Uber without Travis is a little like Apple without Steve Jobs. Still very successful, but it will never be quite the same. It's unclear whether that's a good thing for Uber or not. But what is clear is that Uber is a tale of breaking all the rules and defying all the odds and somehow coming out on top. And whilst Travis has been kicked out of Uber, He's now a billionaire with an even bigger chip on his shoulder. So this may well not be the last you hear of Travis Kalanick. Question. How does WhatsApp make money? And how did TikTok suddenly take over the world? All of these questions and more are being answered on this channel, where you can watch all our business movies and documentaries totally free. Just click one of these videos now to move on to the next episode. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell if you want to see more content like this very soon.